Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming. We're delighted to uh, be back with uh, in person with the practical, the political, the ethical seminar series. Um, Molly Gerber and I are organizing this year uh, and keep an eye out for our very exciting lineup of speakers in the spring, which we'll have out soon. Uh, and today we're very pleased to have with us uh, Daniela Dover from UCLA, who's going to talk about the erotics of curiosity. And thanks to everybody who's joining online. This is an experimental hybrid format, so I'm sure there will be glitches. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and uh, my talk will be mercifully short um, because I'm uh, still at the stage of this project where I really want uh, to get sort of early stage feedback. So um, so we'll have a longer Q&A, which will be good. Um, so my topic today is curiosity. Um, and I'll start by saying a little bit about how curiosity has been understood by contemporary epistemologists. And then I'll argue that these epistemological theories of curiosity fail to capture certain cases of intense, passionate curiosity about complex objects like artworks and human beings. Finally, I'll argue that, and does everyone have a handout? So finally, I'll argue that these special cases of curiosity are best understood via their close connection to uh, erotic love as theorized by Plato in the symposium. So for starters, let's just think about how the idea of curiosity gets invoked nowadays. So traditionally, human curiosity was often regarded with lots of ambivalence, right? So think of all the stories about what happens when you open Pandora's box or eat from the tree of knowledge. Um, but right now, we seem to find ourselves in a very uh, pro-curiosity moment. So according to the ever-fascinating Google Ngram tool, which tracks the frequency of usage of words over time, Usage of the term curiosity reached a nadir in the 80s and 90s, um, but has steadily rebounded at a 45 degree angle since 2000, coinciding with the rise of Silicon Valley. At lifehack.org, the founder of Life Optimizer, a self-improvement blog to help people reach their full potential, offers four reasons why curiosity is important and how to develop it. Uh, the enormously popular TED Talk series advertises, quote, 3,600 plus talks to stir your curiosity, including how to spark your curiosity scientifically, the case for curiosity-driven research, and how we use a shipping container to spark scientific curiosity. <laughs> but it seems that if curiosity is a spark, the resultant fire is conceived of as the sort that needs to be carefully contained and tended. As part of its Managing People series, the Harvard Business Review enlightens us as to why curiosity matters, explaining that new research shows curiosity is vital to an organization's performance and offering guidance to leaders about how to nurture curiosity and perhaps more importantly for these leaders' purposes, ensure that it translates to success. So these managers want to cultivate curiosity because they think its pursuit will lead their employees and other sorts of subordinates to the sorts of discoveries and innovations from which a profit can ultimately be turned. And unfortunately, academic institutions are hardly exempt from this impulse to harness, discipline, and exploit their workers' curiosity. As one university's new employee training video put it, quote, we value insatiable curiosity always be asking, how can I make this university better and more successful? Now, of course, you are hardly an insatiably curious person if you are always asking the same thing. Uh, more often, moreover, uh, cur curiosity cannot be commanded, thanks to Teen Wen, by the way, for uh, quoting that uh, university training video on, on his Twitter feed. Um, moreover, curiosity cannot be commanded in this way. So just as the old pre-Silicon myths had it, curiosity is far more ungovernable than these leaders and managers might hope. On one point, however, we have to agree with the curiosity managers, which is that curiosity operates under conditions of scarcity. And this requires us to make decisions about when and how to pursue it. So as a matter of standing disposition, you might be keen to know both how birds find their way north and how to make this university more successful, but it's hard to investigate both questions at once. 
the intellectual and practical habits and activities that under conditions of abundance, curiosity might naturally prompt, such as sustained attention and exploration, take time and energy. Even the most promiscuously curious person can pursue every line of inquiry that tempts her. So how does curiosity proceed in the face of such scarcity? That's an empirical question, but any adequate answer will have to reckon with the possibility that curiosity might not be a purely epistemic phenomenon. So as the great nature writer, Rachel, Rachel Carson understood, we're most curious about and most willing to expend scarce resources to investigate objects that have some kind of affective significance for us. She writes, once the emotions have been aroused, a sense of the beautiful, the excitement of the new and the unknown, a feeling of sympathy, pity, admiration, or love, then we wish for knowledge about the object of our emotional response. So it's this insight of Carson's that curiosity is often downstream of, and perhaps even inseparable from, other more obviously unruly human passions that I want to explore with you here today. So first, let's take a step back. First, let me fix the problem with my contact lens. I have a contact problem. I need a contact solution. Uh, Cause it's making it really hard to read. Sorry. I don't think this talk is getting posted on the internet. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep on working on this. Um, so this inside of Carson's, um, no, 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 no. Okay, let's take a step back um, and look at how curiosity has been theorized by contemporary epistemologists. So until relatively recently, invocations of curiosity in contemporary epistemology were often rather superficial. Uh, curiosity was something that you would just mention sort of glancingly in the context of talking about what was considered to be the real subject of epistemology, which is knowledge. Um, for instance, curiosity was uh, defined without argument by Timothy Williamson as a desire to know. Um, and uh, by Alvin Goldman as an interest in finding and believing truths. Um, more recently, however, philosophers have taken on the more ambitious task of integrating insights about curiosity gleaned from the social sciences. So from things like uh, studies of animal behavior and child language acquisition. This study of curiosity by cognitive science scientists and psychologists has generally sought to capture two main phenomena. First, there's curiosity's striking motivational power, its capacity to drive inquisitive and exploratory behavior at every level of cognitive sophistication, from the reading habits of historians to the staring habits of infants and perhaps even the flight patterns of bees. Second, there is the apparently non-instrumental character of this motivation. So Aristotle's famous observation that we're curious not only with a view to action, but even when we're not going to do anything, has been steadily bolstered since the 1950s by research on everyone from adult medical patients to rats. This apparently independent motivational power that curiosity has, has led some researchers to regard it as an Ekmanian basic emotion or as a fundamental human drive akin to libido. So in the last couple of decades, uh, engagement with this work in the social sciences has inspired more complex and thoughtful philosophical treatments, which separate out curiosity's content um, from its desideratum or aim. Uh, so for instance, Dennis Whitcomb agrees with Williamson that curiosity is ultimately a desire for knowledge in the sense that its satisfier is knowledge in the way that hunger is a desire whose satisfier is nourishment. But he argues that curiosity's content is a question in the way that a belief's content is a proposition. Jane Friedman further departs from Williamson by casting curiosity as a member of a sui generis class of interrogative attitudes, along with things like wondering and the suspension of judgment, all of which have questions rather than propositions as contents. And Peter Carruthers has drawn on developmental and animal studies for evidence that Friedmanian interrogative attitudes are basic components of human and animal minds. 
So despite important differences among these views, all of these authors agree that curiosity is a desiderative attitude um, whose content is a question and that in some sense aims at knowledge. So we can call this the DQK for desire, question, knowledge, model of curiosity. So I have no quibble with the DQK model when it comes to the sorts of cases that motivate this view for its proponents, such as whether your lottery ticket will win, what a box in the attic contains, or who ate the last slice of pizza. These are all real examples from, uh, from the curiosity literature. Um, so it gives you a sense of what, what people are thinking about when they think about this fundamental human attitude. Um, but consider the fascination with Singapore's urban otter population that prompted the biologist Philip Johns to change his research plans. Johns was so taken by the animals that he abandoned notions of studying colugos. This was his, he switched from his dissertation project during his postdoc, um, abandoning his study of colugos, a, a gliding nocturnal mammal. And he said, evolutionarily speaking, colugos are fascinating but they mostly sit in trees and do nothing. Whereas otters are like wolves. They're like coyotes in water. So is Johns' response to these otters epistemic, aesthetic, ethical? However we wanna characterize it, it's very clearly impassioned. And even though Johns is a scientist involved in the most paradigmatically systematic and controlled sort of epistemic endeavor, his curiosity seems to be running downstream here um, from other not so clearly epistemic responses, like this aesthetic response, seemingly aesthetic response to the canine elegance and power of otters moving through the water. And when it comes to this sort of passionate curiosity, I want to argue that the DQK model falls short. So let's begin with the feature that Johns's curiosity about otters most clearly shares with DQK style curiosity, namely that both serve as a powerful motive. In particular, they can motivate us to engage in effortful inquisitive activities, such as physical exploration, discussion with peers, solitary reflection, and effortful memory retrieval. This sort of inquisitive activity is not only time consuming, but also often frustrating. There are usually more confusions, misunderstandings, and dead ends than there are moments of satisfying lucidity. So why do we bother? At first glance, this seems to be one of those why questions whose answer ultimately has to bottom out eventually in desire. So inquiry is frustrating, um, but we do it anyway because there's something that we want from, or perhaps in, the activity. So the curiosity that motivates an inquiry like John's does seem to be, or at least to involve some kind of desire. So I, I'm, with, I'm with the DQK model that far. Now, the next step for the DQK model is to identify the content of this desire as a question. Now, many cases of curiosity do indeed seem to involve a desire to know the answer to some particular question, just as the DQK model predicts. So one simply wants to know, for example, who killed John F. Kennedy. And if definitive proof were to emerge, say a long lost video that clearly shows the shooter, then one's desire would be satisfied and promptly extinguished. Maybe one would have further questions about why he did it or whatever, but you would now know your curiosity about who killed JFK would be satisfied. Um, and although under real world conditions, this desire to know who killed JFK might be very hard to satisfy, there's nothing inherently unsatisfiable about it. Somebody who wants to kill, to know who, <laughs> to kill, somebody who wants to know who killed JFK may well know exactly what she wants and her desire may correspondingly come to an end once she has got it. So think of, you know, you're on a road trip in a remote place. You want to know how some, you know, crazily named town got its name, but you don't have reception. Instead of once you have reception again, you look it up on Wikipedia and then you're done. You know, you, you understand that it was because there were uh, South African immigrants to this part of the California desert that the town is called Johannesburg. And it's satisfying, right? You got what you wanted. Uh, but I think not all cases of curiosity share this structure. 
So consider the contrast between that sort of satisfiable curiosity about who killed JFK and the sort of insatiable curiosity that a true lover of Shakespeare has about Shakespeare. Now, of course, some cases of curiosity about Shakespeare, such as those that drive a perverse fixation on the authorship controversy, do indeed have the narrow whodunit character of who killed JFK. But as soon as we have an example of great Shakespeare scholarship in front of us, so take, for example, Stanley Cavell's series of essays exploring various questions through the plays, it becomes clear that curiosity about King Lear, for example, need not reduce to a desire to know the answer to some question that's specifiable in advance of your study of Lear. So to be curious about Lear is to be eager to undertake and undergo a range of experiences and activities that you can't yet anticipate and which will lead you to ask questions that you can't yet imagine. This means that there's no antecedently identifiable question or set of questions that could have served as the initial content of your curiosity about Lear in the way that the DQK model envisions. Um, so there's, there's no analog to uh, the way that Carruthers thinks that the question, when will the food arrive, is the content of your curiosity as to when the food will arrive. So I just objected to the idea that there's any single question or determinate set of questions that serves as the content of Cavell's curiosity about Shakespeare. I objected to this on the grounds that a student of Shakespeare can't anticipate in advance all of the questions that her study of Shakespeare will create or reveal. Admittedly, however, the same is true of all sorts of inquiries that nonetheless do seem to be driven by a single overarching master question. For instance, a sociological inquiry into the causes of falling birth rates is gonna bring along countless subsidiary questions with it, many of which can't be predicted in advance. So in that sense, it too amounts to more than a desire to know the answers to a set of antecedently identifiable questions. And yet all of these questions are ultimately subordinate to the question, what caused birth rates to fall? That's what you're trying to figure out. By contrast, I don't think that there needs to be any overarching master question or master question set from which all of Cavell's many unpredictable future questions about Shakespeare are going to spring. For instance, I think it would be absurdly reductive, and this here is an intuition, and we can talk about it. If, uh, some, some, some people have doubted this intuition, but so I'm, this is a place you could push back. But I think it would be absurdly reductive to suppose that all of Cavell's inquiries into Shakespeare were subordinate to some basic or question, like what is the meaning of Shakespeare's plays, or what makes this Shakespeare fellow tick? For somebody who actually loved Shakespeare, I think, curiosity about Shakespeare just will not have that kind of pyramidal question structure. Instead, it's going to involve a heterogeneous, albeit interlocking, set of desires and concomitant dispositions that over time will lead you to ask all sorts of questions and to connect these questions in all sorts of ways. But these questions are going to arise from an antecedent experience of being captivated, compelled, puzzled, maddened, intrigued, drawn to, or thrown by some object, be it a corpus of plays, an urban otter population, or another human being. And I really think that to suggest that such experiences of fasc fascination are a mere symptom of the desire to arrive at the answer to some question would be to get things backwards. These experiences of fascination are themselves amorphously desirous, and they engender, they give rise to further more discrete, uh, less amorphous desires. Um, and the discrete desires that fascination engenders will of course often include desires to know the answers to particular questions, like was Shakespeare gay? Was Shakespeare a woman? But we wouldn't bother with such questions in the first place if we weren't already antecedently fascinated by Shakespeare. So I've been arguing that some cases of profound curiosity involve an experience of, of amorphously desirous fascination and can't be reduced to an attitude toward any particular question or set of questions. And I've suggested that the object of such experiences and of the desires that they engender is typically not a question, but rather some worldly object or phenomenon, for instance, an artwork or a landscape or a person. 
So that's my dissatisfaction with the Q part of the DQK model uh, when it comes to certain cases of curiosity. So the DQK model is, 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 uh, is one for two right now. I'm, I'm good with desire, less, less, less good on question. But how about K? How about the K part? The claim that the T loss of curiosity is knowledge. So if we agree with the DQK model that curiosity is desirous, then what is the aim or unique satisfier, as Whitcomb puts it, of the relevant desire? Now, here I want to zoom in for a moment on the special case of curiosity about a person. I think what I'm about to say is true of other objects of curiosity too, but I think we can see it most clearly in the case of curiosity about a person. So when the object of your amorphously desirous fascination is another human being, what exactly is it that you want with or from or at or about that person? Sometimes it seems that what we want is indeed some kind of knowledge. That at least seems to be the idea behind the show tune. So getting to know you, getting to know all about you, when I'm with you, getting to know what to say, haven't you noticed suddenly I'm bright and breezy because of all the beautiful and new things I'm learning about you day by day, right? So Rogers and Hammerstein are ostensibly describing the excitement of falling in love. But it's a description that I think bodes rather badly for the future of these lovers. If, curi if curiosity's desire is to get to know you, then presumably its satisfier in Wickham's sense is to know, that is to have gotten to know you whatever that might mean. Um, so how will we be able to tell when this desire has been satisfied, when we've got the satisfier? Um, how do you know that you've reached the end of inquiry with respect to another human being? So one thing that I think could pretty decisively suggest that the desire that prompted your inquiries into another person has been satisfied uh, would be to become terminally bored with that person. Uh, so I've been told that you know you're done, finally done with a philosophy paper when it bores you so much that you can't even stand to read it anymore. Um, so analogously, perhaps, you know you're done with a person when they bore you so much that you can't stand or just can't be bothered to read or interpret them anymore. This would be like a depressing denouement to the show too. So I've gotten to know you, now I know all about you. When I'm with you, I know just what to say. So uh, the, the, the living, it's bad, right? <laughs> um, so um, it's bad and yet, you know, people somehow seem attached to this ideal of being known through and through. Um, we can talk about it. Um, but so the, it seems like in, in, in this case, the living person would have sort of receded into the distance um, as your representation of them stops changing, um, leaving behind a kind of taxidermied epistemic trophy that if you want, we can call knowledge. Uh, but this seems like a pretty grim conclusion to an inquiry that has supposedly been conceived in love. But perhaps what's so grim is not so much that the inquiry has ended badly, but that it has ended at all. So perhaps curiosity about another human being can only be satisfied, which is to say extinguished, if it wasn't the right kind of curiosity in the first place. At its best, we might think that curiosity about another human being should instead be self-replenishing. The process of inquiry should deepen and reinforce curiosity rather than exhausting or satisfying it. So to take stock, I've argued so far that certain cases of curiosity are distinct from DQK style curiosity in that while they do tend to give rise to questioning behavior, of course, they can't be reduced to an attitude toward any question or question set. Rather, they involve an amorphously desirous fascination with some object. And while I think we sometimes often maybe misinterpret such fascination as a desire to know all about its object, we've, I've given you some reason to doubt that this framing is ultimately adequate when we're trying to capture paradigmatic cases of curiosity, such as the perennial curiosity of the lover or the naturalist or the Shakespeare scholar. For there's no store of knowledge about Shakespeare or otters or one's beloved, such that once she's acquired it, the truly curious person is simply going to be happy to rest on her laurels or yield to boredom. 
So in closing, I wanna to turn to Plato's treatment of Eros in the symposium, because I think it's there that we can find the best model for these cases of curiosity that resist assimilation to the DQK model. So what was Eros for fifth century Athenians like Plato? As the poet, poet and classicist Ann Carson notes, the Greek word Eros, which Frisbee Sheffield aptly translates as erotic love or better passionate desire, this word denotes want, lack, or desire for what is missing. So when Socrates recounts what he's learned about Eros from the priestess Diotima, he gives symbolic expression to this aspect of erotic phenomenology by casting Penea uh, as a mother of Eros. Penea means poverty or lack. Um, so this connection of Eros to some kind of uh, deficiency illustrates one important aspect of the phenomenology of curiosity, which is that like Eros, curiosity feels privative. It feels like the experience of a lack, of something partial that wants to be made whole, or of something thwarted or stuck that wants to be allowed to escape or to proceed. This accounts for the unstable and somewhat uncomfortable character of both experiences. Like sexual longing, curiosity is nervous, prickly, goading. It's not a state in which we can rest contentedly. But although Eros is born into deprivation, he inherits another legacy from his father's side. In Diotima's story, Penea, Eros's mother, shows up begging at a feast that the gods are holding to celebrate the birth of Aphrodite. And at this feast, this figure of poverty pulls off an impressive feat of seduction. She manages to seduce Poros, whose name means resource or pathfinding, and who is the son of Matus, cunning. So this paternal heritage ensures that their child won't be passive in the face of his inherited poverty. The English expression, love finds a way, points toward this same idea. So Eros may descend from a lack, but is not helpless or uh, passive in the face of this lack. Instead, it's restlessly and ingeniously resourceful. This illustrates another important aspect of the phenomenology of curiosity. So I'm not curious if I'm already satisfied, um, as we've seen already, but I'm also not curious if I just sort of sit there and passively lament what I lack. Um, so like love, curiosity is a powerful motive. It's something that launches schemes and consumes lives. Plato played up these connections between curiosity and eros in the Cratylus by punning on the phonetic similarity between the noun eros and the verb eroton, which means to question a person or to ask about a thing, and suggesting that there was an uh, etym etymological kinship there. This play on words alters the meaning of Socrates' famous remark that erotic matters are the only area in which he can really claim expertise. Socrates could be claiming here that it is his inquisitiveness that makes him a good lover, or that it is his amorousness that makes him a good inquirer. In any event, the suggestion would seem to be that love, and at least a certain kind of curiosity, flourish and perhaps perish together. So taking our cue from this suggestion, I'm gonna call curiosity of the sort that I've been extending so far, erotic curiosity. We've seen that like platonic eros, erotic curiosity feels teleological. It feels like a desire for something, a desire of the sort that could at least in principle be satisfied. And it drives us to inquisitive action and reflection in much the same way as DQK style curiosity does. But whereas DQK style curiosity, for example, curiosity to know who killed JFK has a relatively clear telos, Paradigmatic cases of deep and enduring erotic curiosity, like about Shakespeare, the natural world, once beloved, seem not to. So it helps at this point to stand back and, and distinguish among different ways in which desire can be, or at least appear to be, teleologically structured. All conscious desires are, at a phenomenological level, teleological in character. So the desirous person feels in some way dissatisfied with the world as it is and wishes for an alternative. 
But in some desires, it's the dissatisfaction that dominates, uh, whereas in others, it's the wish. Um, and the wished for alternatives can be more or less clearly specified or envisioned, and for that matter, more or less clearly specifiable or imaginable. Taken together, these dimensions of variation make some desires much more pointedly telic than others. So their satisfactions are clear and distinct, and the desire is gonna be satisfied as soon as these satisfaction conditions are met. So to want a shower after a long run is to know precisely what it will take to extinguish my desire. Once I'm washed and dressed in clean clothes, I'll be sorted with respect to that desire. Whereas other desires are much more amorphous and diffuse than that, so much so that it can be difficult or even impossible to individuate them by telos. We recognize them not by a state of affairs that the desire aims to bring about, but by the distinctive phenomenology of the desire itself. So here you can think of religious yearning, nostalgia, wanderlust, uh, you know, utopian aspiration, as along with sexual longing. These are all cases in point. These are all things where they have a distinctive phenomenology, but it would be very hard, if not impossible, to say uh, what would it take to just be completely content and free of this desire. This is something that Aristophanes points out in the symposium, describing what we would nowadays call enduring romantic love. He says, these long-term lovers are the people who finish out their lives together and still can't say what it is that they want from one another. It's obvious that the soul of every lover longs for something else. His soul cannot say what it is, but like an oracle, it has a sense of what it wants. And like an oracle, it hides behind a riddle. So it has a sense of what it wants, and yet it can't say what it wants. So this description of the elusive enigmatic character of the lover's desire is abstract and metaphorical. Um, but of course, it's instantly recognizable, right? Such experiences, although they're difficult to describe in flatly literal philosophical prose, are really easy to extend to anyone who has had them. In some such cases, it's hard to identify the telos of a desire because the structure of the desire is recursive in one way or another. So some desires are desires to experience desire itself, where that experience of desire is in turn relished for its own sake. For instance, the desire of a depressed person to regain their zest for life is a desire to feel desirously drawn to the world, to escape an experience of anhedonia or listlessness that itself consists in the absence of desire. Other desires are desires to engage in some activity that's animated by the desire, uh, where both the activity and the experience of desire that animates it are valued in themselves. For instance, an artist's pressing desire for creation and expression is a desire to engage in creative activity that will be suffused and guided throughout by that very desire. For those in the grip of such autotelic desires, the question of satisfaction conditions is largely moot. The point is not to consummate and thereby extinguish the desire. If anything, it is to prolong, intensify, and deepen it. So for example, suppose that I could through some science fictional surgery instantly come into possession of the fruits of a life spent studying Shakespeare. In my mnemonic command, the delicacy of my observations, the weaving of Shakespeare's plays into all of my thinking and living, I would be functionally indistinguishable from the greatest living Shakespeare scholars. This would truly be an enviable state of affairs. But anyone who would be happy to arrive there, who'd be entirely happy to arrive, I'm not saying I wouldn't take the shortcut, but anyone who'd be entirely happy to arrive there by this shortcut is I think missing the point. To become curious about Shakespeare in the right way means being eager to undertake this kind of roving, unpredictable process of inquiry and exploration. This sort of curiosity is less like a desire to get to the bottom of a question than it is like a desire to explore a landscape. It's an autotelic desire that prompts us to engage in inquisitive activities that are valued in their own right. So I don't wanna deny that there are forms of love that don't require curiosity and forms of curiosity that don't spring from love. 
Um, actually, I do want to deny that there are forms of love that don't require curiosity, but not here. Um, but I don't want to deny that there are forms of curiosity that don't spring from love, like when will the pizza arrive? Um, but my suggestion is that a sui generis phenomenon arises in these places where love and curiosity meet, a phenomenon that stretches our ordinary epistemic concepts at their seams. As we've seen, this kind of erotic curiosity is not reducible to an attitude toward any particular question or set of questions, although of course it prompts us to ask plenty of questions. Nor is it best understood as a quest for knowledge, although it may lead us to accumulate plenty of knowledge. And although it is desirous, it doesn't have a classic goal-oriented teleological structure like the desire for a shower after a long run. It derives its motivational force less from the pull of any discrete antecedently identifiable end, aim, or goal than from an inchoate experience of lack or incompleteness, a longing for some kind of hazily envisaged communion with its object. And although such longings are ultimately unsatisfiable, we can recognize them. This is the, 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 the recompense to, uh, uh, un unfortunately they're unsatisfiable, but our recompense is that we can recognize them as valuable in themselves, as emotions that draw us beyond ourselves, both cognitively and effectively, affectively. <laughs> um, and also as prompts to engage in further valuable activities, such as interaction with aesthetic appreciation of uh, reflection on and further inquiry into the beloved object. So with this proposal in hand, we can revisit an older suggestion that curiosity has an autotelic character, namely Aristotle's famous declaration that all men by nature desire to know. He goes on, an indication of this is the delight we take in our senses, for even apart from their usefulness, they're loved for themselves, not only with a view to action, but even when we are not going to do anything. So I, this is on your handout. So beginning with an indication, Aristotle's remarks here could be about erotic curiosity as we have characterized it. So our only departure from Aristotle is in refusing to reduce this delight we take to a mere symptom of an antecedent desire to know. So what I wanna leave you with is a question of what exactly would be lost if instead of desire to know, we said something like love to inquire. And my, my instinct is that not much would be lost at least when it comes to the sort of inquiries that I've been talking about today. Indeed, I think there's a lot to be gained by thinking of these inquiries, not as an acquisitive quest for knowledge, but as a way of delighting in one another and in the world that we share for itself, apart from its usefulness, and even when we are not going to do, or for that matter, trying to know anything in particular. So thank you, and I'm really excited to hear your questions.